Chief Mark Garrett, it seems like with Boeing, it seems like, you know, we recorded a podcast a little while ago and uh, can't seem to get it out because there's always something new in the news about them. And sure enough, uh, another whistleblower has perished last week. Uh, a strange, really strange circumstances on this one. And, and we'll get, we'll talk about that at the end, Mark, with uh, the first whistleblower who we spoke about, who was found dead in his car, apparent suicide. Uh, what was his name? It was Barnett, John Barnett. Yep, Barnett. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe around, uh, at the end as well. But, you know, it's interesting. This guy, uh, Joshua Dean is his name, this other or latest whistleblower that passed away. He was actually not an employee of Boeing. He was at uh, Spirit Aero, the company that makes the fuselages or assembles the fusel fuselages for Boeing. And he said that he raised quality concerns uh, at the Wichita, Kansas plant sometime in October 22. And what he was saying was that holes were drilled in the bulkhead of the planes improperly that could at some point lead to depressurization depressurization, which is obviously catastrophic or can be catastrophic in an airplane. And uh, at the very least, the way these these fuselages were assembled, he said, was kind of reducing the um, the useful life of them, right? Right. So when was that? That was October 22. He was fired in April 23. So, so what happened and how he came to be fired, according to Boeing at least, is there was another issue with the plane he was working on in the tail section. And um, this is a 737. And he was criticized for not identifying that issue. And his response was, hey, I was so focused on this issue with uh, the holes drilled improperly in the fuselages that maybe I wasn't paying enough attention to this tail fin section. But um, he feels that he was made the scapegoat and he was fired. And this is, a, this is a tough one, Mark, because I know you and I both worked at large organizations, right? California mm -hmm. Highway Patrol, DEA. And there's, uh, you know, a lot of these situations when an employee is terminated and then comes out and makes allegations or, uh, and, and listen, in this case, it appears that these, these concerns were documented long before he was ever fired, right? But it's sometimes difficult to draw the line between what's, let's call it sour grapes, you know, right. and someone trying to get revenge on their employer when they were fired and what is legitimate, uh, you know, let's call it legitimate whistleblower retaliation. Um, well, what do you think about that when you, when, when you see that he did make a report and within six months of making the report, apparently he's fired. What, where does that sit with you? Like, how, yeah, like, it's where a, do you listen, think that... like you said, Bill, coming from these respective organizations that you and I worked for, we've seen this. Uh, I know as a, a special agent in charge for you, as a chief for me, we've seen these types of um, responses from employees that have been terminated or sometimes even resign and then come back and make allegations about the workplace, about the pressure and things like this. So when I read these, these articles, um, you know, I try to look at it from a very objective point mm -hmm. and it's, it's not easy because the appearances, the appearances, we, we see these spectacular, um, examples of literal failures from Boeing airframes, um, from the doors blowing off and then we had some i think some landing gear fall off another one or fail things like this so we see these very very spectacular examples um and then you couple that with these employees it's very difficult to have an emotional reaction not have an emotional reaction of oh this is a clear-cut case it's very difficult not to go there and i'm trying to stay that walk that line of objectivity and wait for more information to come out right what is What's very compelling, at least in an initial uh, sense, are the debt surrounding these whistleblowers. And we're, we're going to talk about this, this latest one. It's a very compelling thing. And, and this is where conspiracy theories are, are bred. 
but this is where they they you know propagate and i'll i'll let you talk about that and i'm going to give you my two cents on this latest this latest uh, situation with the, the death of a whistleblower yeah so, so let's talk that. about how he died and again this is uh joshua dean he was described as being extremely healthy. I think he visited a doctor so infrequently that he, the report that I saw said he didn't even have a primary physician. In other words, there wasn't a doctor that he was kind of regularly seeing for checkups or visiting uh, frequently with, with problems. Now, he went to urgent care one day because he had some trouble breathing, um, had the flu, which turned into pneumonia, and then he somehow developed uh, MRSA from it. Mm -hmm. And I think within two weeks of going to that urgent care, he was gone. He was dead. And, you know, getting... Uh, see, I always thought of MRSA as um, a contact um, infection. You know what I mean? In other words, yes. you're, 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 you're picking it up somewhere or you have an open cut or something and you're in a gym or some type of facility that's not clean and you get the infection that way i'm not really you know i'm listen i'm obviously not any kind of medical professional um you you had where did you did you see is that account of how he died and his sickness accurate from what you read and um does that sound a little strange i mean i guess nowadays respiratory Things are, you know, frequent and and uh, common. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, the account the, the is is uh, consistent with what I've read. What the the account of his demise, you know, doesn't indicate, and maybe even physicians don't know, is where and how he contracted MRSA. Right. Um, unless you, you know, you have some other information, Bill. But I'm not aware. Of, and by the way, I think it's usually the case. No one really knows for sure, but. The MRSA, um, the MRSA example here is one that's pretty close to home for me because about, oh, I guess about, it's been probably 15 years now, maybe a little more. Uh, one of my very, very best friends in the world contracted MRSA. Extremely healthy, extremely athletic person. Um, really similar situation. Hardly ever saw a doctor for for right. anything and probably should have like we all should for checkups but he didn't have any cause in any acute or obvious reason to see a doctor on a regular basis this was a young man um you know in his mid-40s uh and he contracted he didn't know what he had he didn't know similar thing he was having respiratory issues fevers um and then he actually had some some indications on the surface of his body skin um infected areas he got diagnosed with having contracted MRSA. He is still in and out of the hospital. Thank God he's still alive. But what MRSA has done to his body, I can't describe uh, wow. in a reasonable amount of time on the show. And uh, again, fortunately still alive, but often it is deadly and fairly quickly deadly, as it, it looks like here with Mr. Dean, um, uh, the, this whistleblower. So I... I say all that just to put into context the situation. These things can happen yeah. very randomly. In other words, in, in a, you know, as an appearance, it could happen to anybody, so to speak. Like you said, the gymnasium is a really good example of an environment uh, in which you can contract uh, MRSA. So it can happen to anybody. I don't think that if someone was actually intending to terminate Mr. Dean's life that MRSA would be the simplest and easy, easiest way to go about it. There are probably other methods that they might want to use. So I look at this as just a very, very bizarre, random incident that happened to somebody who happens to be in the spotlight. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that, with that um, assessment. And, you know, one thing about MRSA today is uh, a lot of anti antibiotic resistant strains and you know, I mean, that's a whole other story, but yeah, it's difficult. You know, some of them now, um, difficult to beat w when you get them. Um, I agree, Mark. And, and even although I see the, uh, 
I do see that the suicide of John Barnett is still, quote, under investigation by the local authorities, but the coroner did make a ruling that it was self-inflicted. Uh, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. I think, um, and I don't know that there's a real, uh, conspiracy there. Um, I, I think probably not. Uh, yes. Hey, Mark, the only other thing to wrap up Boeing is uh, I saw that just, um, I don't know, about uh, back on May 8th, a a Boeing plane in Senegal, in Dakar. So they tried to take off, and for some reason, it's what's described, the description I saw was a failed takeoff attempt, right? Mm -hmm. No harm, no foul. They tried to take off a second time, and there was smoke and fire coming from one of the wings and uh it's the plane slid off the runway um 10 this is a 737 300 10 people were hurt yeah i don't know engine fuel tank who knows what it was but mark at some point like when it when there's a car accident you know when you're working uh west la and there's an automobile accident on the 10 freeway in west la is it the auto manufacturer's issue if the brakes failed, or is it maybe a maintenance issue or the brake maker's issue? I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, every time there's an incident now with a, with an airplane, you hear it um, associated with Boeing, let's say, as if Boeing is at fault. And I know I, I spoke to a neighbor of mine who's a retired pilot. He said a lot of the issues that are out there now that he's reading about blown tire um, landing gear, et cetera, not necessarily the fault of the manufacturer of the plane, but maintenance, um, yes. maintenance issues that he sees. And also don't forget that the standards in the United States, and I think we spoke about this, on um, pilots and maintenance are higher than elsewhere in the world. Hey, there's, are there a lot of incidents involving Boeing planes? Yes, but there's also a lot of Boeing planes in the fleet. I think worldwide, um, worldwide. I don't know if there's a thousand. I thought I had noted somewhere how many of these planes that were out there. I think uh, something like 150 or something of the new Dreamliners in the U.S. registered and a thousand worldwide. I mean, that's a lot of planes to be out there. Um, if there's maintenance issues, you're gonna have you're gonna have issues with them. Yeah, I, there's no doubt, Bill. You're you're 100 right that and, and often. Um, some of the accidents that I investigated uh, over the years were uh, definably the result of poor maintenance mm -hmm. by, uh, say, a, a recent auto repair shop. One of the most common examples of that is are, are rotating tires or putting new tires in a car. And guess what? A mechanic not having tightened down the lug nuts on the wheel. Wow. It happened. It happened way too often to the point where when I had my tires rotated, or new tires put on, or or brakes checked, and anything that took the wheel off the 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 rim off of the the wheel of a car. Yeah, I personally made sure I walk around with the mechanic. Hey, did you tighten all these? Tighten all these. Make sure. Make sure. Make sure. <laughs> right. So, um, and we see enough wheels fly off in the freeway. So that that happens. There's no doubt that look, it's a it's a two pronged approach here. You have to have quality in uh, the uh, design, the engineering, and the manufacturer. And, of course, you have to have consistent high-level maintenance. These are very, very complex machines, um, uh, probably hundreds of thousands, if not more, moving parts uh, on, on these machines. And so the maintenance is uh, utmost as far as the consistency of, of safety. I will say this as well. Mm -hmm. And and you made the point, Bill, about how many Boeing planes are are in the air around the world. Look, in today's world of AI and algorithms and things like this, we know now that when a paint chip flies off of the nose cone of a, a 737, whatever, or Boeing, whatever model it is, it's got to get reported in the news. And so, again, it's, a, it's an area where, um, you know, I want to... Um, retain my objectivity and let the facts come out now right. having said that what i guess with the number of people who have spoken and some of the things that are, are very clear when you have when you have a a piece of the airframe the fuselage you know fly off this this door 
did something catastrophic. When I say catastrophic, I mean in the sense of something that should have been obvious. Did something actually go wrong in the process, either manufacturing or maintenance? Clearly, and it sh right. should be in the headlines, obviously. But we have to be very careful here about looking at all the numbers relative to all of the other manufacturers, the number of planes in the sky, how often these things happen. And if Boeing is accountable, then 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 by all means, they should be held accountable. We'll have to see. I will say this, um, that I did read an article where a lawyer says that he has at least, I believe it was 10 uh, more whistleblowers coming forward. Wow. And some of these are, you said, Bill, they actually work for um, the uh, Spirit Air, and right. some are actually Boeing, uh, Boeing employees. So um, we will see over time. Um, and again, this doesn't, this doesn't give us a comparison about maybe some whistleblowers that have come forward with Airbus or other manufacturers that we just don't know about. It may yeah. have happened, may have not happened for similar situations. Whistleblowers aren't anything new, but this situation here, because it's, it's, it's so, you know, front and center in the media, we're all going to pay attention. We should pay attention. Like I said, let's see where the facts take us. And I think that Boeing one way or another is going to straighten up if, if they are culpable for any shortcomings. Yep, I agree with all that, Mark. The final question I have for you is, will you fly Boeing? Yes. Yeah, me too. I've, I've, yes. I've talked to some people who say no, but um, hey, it's, it's, I think you're, look at, the, look at the airline safety record and maintenance record first and maybe be more concerned with that than, your manu than the manufacturer at this point. Uh, that's Great. it, folks. If it's Boeing, I am going. It sounds like the chief is too. We're not going to be. We're, we're not going to. Uh, we're not going to pass on it. Uh, thanks By for the joining way, us. If it's the yeah. Airbus, I might fuss. But if it's right. Boeing, I'm going. <laughs> there you go.